Thank you. Um, so sorry about you're all hungry. I'll try to be quick. Um, I want to give a new perspective on, try at least, to give a new perspective on the Bell Theorem. Um, and because this meeting is uh, celebrating David Bohm, I try to say a few things that relate to Bohmian theory, and, and in particular to actually some of the things Basil talked about uh, yesterday. Um, just as a starter, um, I want to uh, uh, think about the Penrose impossible triangle uh, on, shown on the left. And ask yourself, why is it so mind-boggling? Why is it so difficult to uh, get your head round? And the answer is that we instinctively assume that uh, any two arms of this triangle are getting arbitrarily close uh, as we approach a vertex of the triangle. And if you relax that assumption, which uh, we can see in the actual physical example on the right, then you can construct the triangle. And in fact, the, what we're seeing on the left is in some sense a projection of that three-dimensional object. So in other words, we, we are mind-boggled uh, because we instinctively use the wrong metric uh, to analyze this object. And if we use the right three-dimensional metric, it becomes comprehensible. I want to argue that uh, the same problem, uh, in my view, applies to the Bell theorem, that we're using the wrong metric and in particular the wrong state space metric uh, to analyze the Bell theorem. Um, now, in number theory, uh, there are two and only two, by a famous theorem called the Ostrowski theorem, uh, there are two and only two inexact ways of defining a metric on the set of rational numbers. One is the familiar Euclidean metric, and the other is the so-called p-adic metric. Um, now, to understand p-adic metrics and p-adic numbers, uh, it's useful to, um, to utilize a correspondence uh, between p-adic metrics and fractals. Um, and in fact, the uh, front cover of this book, uh, which, is what I, which is written for ma uh, undergraduate mathematicians, I learned most of my p-adic numbers from this book, um, shows on the front cover uh, a, a, a fractal, a Cantor set, a self-similar set based on uh, seven uh, repeating hexagons. So within each hexagon, there are seven hexagons, and with each in each of those, there are seven more. And in fact, the big one you see is actually part of a much uh, bigger hexagon. So this is a type of self-similar uh, Cantor set. It would be associated with P equals seven, seven for seven iterated pieces. On the bottom right, um, you see a, um, a similar uh, Cantor set based on uh, five uh, uh, quadrilaterals, um, uh, again, iterated. And again, this, uh, this uh, um, five, five element Cantor set uh, is, is in, in some precise sense, homeomorphic to um, a certain subset of the so-called p-adic numbers. Now, the p-adic metric, the crucial point about the p-adic metric and how it differs from the Euclidean metric is that it respects the primacy of this uh, Cantor set structure. And in particular, the distance between a point x here and a point y, both of which lie on the Cantor set, is smaller than the distance between x and a point z, which does not lie on the Cantor set. And this discrepancy in distance gets bigger, uh, the bigger is p. So if you construct a, 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 a Cantor set based on a, a, a p, p iterated pieces, which would be a kind of p minus 1 agon with a single p in the center, then the distance between this point z and x would be very much larger, p, p, at least p times larger than the distance between x and y. And this will be a crucial uh, thing in, I, in my discussion uh, below. Just as an um, unashamed uh, um, uh, name dropping, uh, Andrew Wiles uh, at Oxford uh, said to me once that we number theorists tend to work almost as much p-adically as with the reals or complexes and it is, in fact, usually best to consider all at once. And I think this, this will be a theme of what I want to talk about. So let me just make some link with physics. And imagine that we've got a trajectory in state space, or what we in quantum physics often call a history, some sort of tra trajectory uh, evolving in time of a, of a system, uh, or it could be the universe in a particular subset of, of state space showing a particular system. Now, I want to bring in this idea of a, of a fractal structure by imagining that if we zoom into this uh, history, we actually see it's comprised, it has a certain structure. It's not just a one-dimensional line, 
And in particular, it has uh, p, uh, if you like, smaller scale trajectories wrapped around in a helix. If I did a cross section through this little tube, I would see, I've just drawn it for p equals 5, but you have to kind of generalize this for a large p. I see these five pieces with one in the middle. And then if I were to zoom into one of these smaller scale trajectories, I would set, see yet uh, smaller scale trajectories still. This doesn't actually have to go on to infinitesimally small scales. We can truncate this after some finite scale. In fact, an important part of what I want to say is that this is a very finite um, description. Um, I want to introduce the notion of decoherence and measurement by imagining that these, uh, tr these say, p trajectories here, as they interact with the environment, uh, start to exponentially diverge from each other into uh, discrete uh, clusters or regimes which I can give labels and can be linked somehow to the eigenstates of, of Hilbert, uh, uh, Hilbert states. In fact, this whole um, picture can be given um, a Hilbert uh, vector type of representation. So if I want to represent uh, one of these trajectories, which I don't know whether it evolves into this uh, regime or this regime, I can represent it probabilistically by this complex Hilbert vector. But there's a crucial point here, which is that the uh, amplitude squared, which gives the, if you like, the probability that one of these trajectories, let's say, belongs to the A regime, this, uh, this uh, complex squared amplitude must be um, uh, some ratio n1, uh, an integer n1, divided by p. In other words, it must be a rational number. Um, so in particular, then, the cosine must be a rational number. And similarly, the phase angle, which is a describing a kind of rotation around this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, fractal trajectory, must also be, as a fraction of 2 pi, some sort of finite uh, rotation, n2 over p. So again, uh, a rational number. Now, a point about the crucial point here is that if we were to sort of hypothetically consider a Hilbert vector with an irrational cosine, uh, uh, amplitude cosine, or an irrational phase number, this by construction will not be um, ontic. And by this piadic metric, because such an irrational Hilbert vector doesn't correspond to anything on this uh, fractal, so it corresponds to, if you like, one of my z points out here, it's necessarily distant. It's in this metric g, sorry, which I should have uh, just referred to. So g is my, if you like, piadic-like metric, which respects the primacy of this, this Cantor set. Then one of these irrational Hilbert states is, is necessarily distant from the ontic states. Now that really contrasts fundamentally from kind of conventional theory where we base our theories on the real or complex numbers, which necessarily have the Euclidean distance, the whole concept of the real line. It's the Cauchy sequences closed with the Euclidean metric. Then this notion of making a nontic distinction between irrational Hilbert states and rational Hilbert states is completely meaningless. But in this uh, piadic metric, it does make sense to separate them. So my ontic states were necessarily Hilbert vectors where this amplitude squared is rational and this phase angle is rational. Um, the, the bigger picture is something I call invariant set theory, somewhat motivated by work in, in chaos, which I do a lot of as my day job. But the idea is we assume uh, a kind of fractal geometry, which I call I subscript U, uh, in cosmological state space on which the universe evolves and from which the laws of physics ultimately derive. And I would say that this IU is a manifestation of, of Bohmian wholeness and of the Bohm highly undivided universe. And because everything is based on IU um, and this, met this metric GP respects the primacy of IU, this is why my analysis, all the analysis I want to do is with respect to this GP. A um, couple of papers in the literature which you can ask me about if you're interested in. And an un another unashamed quote from Basil, just as he comes in, um, that I, I kind of resonate with. He said, quant yesterday, quantum processes are not going on in space-time. My own view is a lot of quantum processes actually go on uh, in state space. Um, so continuing on, I want to get to the Bell theorem now. And I'm afraid this will be a little bit rushed. But this is the CHSH inequality. And I just want to focus on the first two terms in, this, uh, in the inequality. 
So this corresponds to Alice uh, uh, measuring with respect to the zero direction, Bob with respect to the zero direction, and then a second correlation where Alice measures with respect to the one direction. This is gone. Okay, and Bob, has anyone got a pointer I could use? Um, and, uh, and Bob with respect to the, um, uh, the zero direction. Now, when we set up uh, Bell experiments, these three angles, we try, we sort of generally assume they're coplanar, but it's going to be impossible to make them precisely coplanar. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm going to represent them uh, as by a kind of non, these three points, x equals naught, y equals naught, y equals one, by a, uh, a non-degenerate triangle. Now in my theory, because it's based on, because it's based on complex, uh, sorry, because it's based yeah, on complex Hilbert vectors, the correlations uh, are, are the same as in quantum theory, but with the proviso that these cosines must be rational numbers. Otherwise, this correlation function is undefined. Now, the key point is, just using number theory, and I haven't got time to say why, um, it's impossible to draw a triangle on the sphere where the cosines of all the three sides are rational and the internal angles are rational. This is a number theoretic impossibility for a, a non-degenerate triangle. So that means in this theory, if you say if this side is well-defined, has a well-defined rational cosine, then, for example, this side does not have a... A, a, a rational cosine and is undefined. So when we do experiments, we measure these correlations, for example, on different days of the week. Then what we're doing is we ensure that both of those sides, for example, are, do have rational cosines by construction, but then they don't necessarily meet in a point. So the, uh, the zero direction on Monday, Bob's o zero direction on Monday, will not co correspond precisely to Bob's zero direction on Tuesday. Now, the point is that just like the Penrose Triangle, you might think that these two points are close together, just like you think these two arms are close together. But in this GP metric, they're not. Because this is a rational, has a rational cosine, and this has a rational, irrational cosine, these are actually distant from each other uh, in this uh, piadic space. So I'm going to make the seemingly outrageous claim that in theory, the Bell inequality is undefined. It's neither satisfied nor violated. But the inequalities that are violated experimentally, because they're essentially these ones, are not even approximately close to the Bell inequality, which is essentially this triangle. So I'm sorry that's an outrageous claim, but how much time do I have? Uh, running, out. running out. I'd like to say something about the link to classical physics, but I fear I have no time but to ask me uh, afterwards. I just want to say that Einsteinian determinism and causality, um, yeah, this, this actually depends on the, sorry, I don't, I'm going to make one point which I haven't, can't justify. I can go to classical theory by letting P equal infinity. And this is well known in, in number theory. You, the, the Pianic metric goes to the Euclidean metric in a singular limit, P equals infinity. So I can, I can, certainly say that uh, Einsteinian determinism and causality is inconsistent with classical hidden variable theory at p equals infinity. But my main conclusion is it's not Einsteinian determinism and causality in a non-classical theory, which I, by which I mean a theory where I use a finite p and this gp is not Euclidean. That is not inconsistent with experiment. Um, I wanted to say... Uh, a couple of remarks, but I have obviously no time. Uh, th this relates something to Jan, what Jan talked about um, at the beginning, and actually something Roger has talked about, which is to do with computability. Uh, because this uh, statement using this GP metric is, is what I would call computationally irreducible. So you, it, it means that you can't actually decide it with a computer that is a subset of the universe. The whole universe may be computational, but if you tr it's this maximal uh, Kolmogorov complexity that Nicolas Gissant talked about. This is actually, uh, 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 has maximal uh, Kolmogorov complexity. So if you have a subset of your system, which in this context is a subset of the universe, that subset cannot decide that proposition. So essentially, for uh, practical purposes, 
we're dealing with non-computable systems. And that is very important, and I'm not going to dwell upon this, uh, Chairman, but this is crucially important in arguing, is my theory, does it kind of violate free will? Well, it doesn't. Is it conspiratorial? No, it isn't. Is it fine-tuned? No, it isn't because of GP. And is it retrocausal? No, it isn't. But I wish I had more time to go through that slide. I just want to say briefly about Bohmian theory. My view is that this is suggesting that the quantum potential might itself be a, some sort of smoothed uh, representation of this fractal geometry. If that's the case, then we can imagine a kind of modified Bohmian theory that actually doesn't have this non-local property. And I want to just refer to the work of Basil, um, uh, his, his, his approach to getting uh, a, a, an approximation to the quantum potential from non-commutative geometry. And in Alain Cohn's book, uh, one of the main, or one of, certainly an important application of non-commutative geometry is as a rigorous tool for analyzing fractal sets. Uh, I just want to say, so what about any of this? The reason I do this is I, I did a PhD many years ago in general relativity and uh, motivated a lot by Roger, um, felt very strongly that, quant that gravitation theory was not, we're not going to synthesize gravitation and quantum physics within the overarching framework of quantum theory. And so I've been seeking to sort of do the, try to find an alternative way where we try to represent quantum physics within the overarching framework of a, of a geometry that is, uh, that is causal and deterministic. Um, and my proposal is, is that this is it. And uh, it just allows me to say finally that this P that I've mentioned of piadic, uh, the inverse of P would, would, would be a measure of the relative weakness of gravity. Thank you. Thank you.